Cool. Um, let's get going. So, thanks, folks. I'm here to talk about uh, Flat Up in 2023. I'm here joined remotely by George Castro, um, who's kind of something of our adopted community manager for Flat Hub. Um, just to kind of recap, Flat, uh, Flat Hub has been running since 2017. So we set up with this idea of creating a, a kind of single service, a single destination that would allow a direct connection between uh, app developers for Linux and uh, app users. So um, on the developer side, removing barriers to publishing and updating applications, making that a smooth and easy flow. Um, and on the user side, removing barriers to discovering and installing and using applications. So kind of really connecting that direct conversation between uh, developers and users. Um, the other thing that we've been looking at is removing kind of just general barriers to growth of the ecosystem. And so one of those we feel is, is economic, that there's a, a kind of uh, inclusivity problem to requiring people to just spend their time, uh, spare time, or uh, if they're lucky to have the job, but uh, only being able to, to kind of earn um, money through open source software in, in very, very narrow circumstances. So just removing that financial barrier and the ability for people to, to have um, not just a, you know, bugs and things, but also an economic conversation with their users, um, which is a big focus for this year. Um, so looking back where we are currently, um, we just passed 2,000 applications. I think probably 2,200 or something at this point, which is really cool. Um, I like this graph because it just has a little curve in it, which suggests it's going to keep on going up in a very uh, satisfying way. Um, when I wrote a blog post last month, we were at 700,000 um, daily downloads. This is now basically now sort of consistently over 800,000 uh, app downloads each day, which is um, really, really cool. Um, and <laughs> thanks to Parsley, uh, we are servicing uh, over a billion requests a day, uh, 127 terabytes on you know, 95th uh, percent of the days. So um, we are moving a lot of applications to a lot of users. Um, and I think, you know, as part of our conversation with OS vendors, Linux distributors, um, the, the thing that's, you know, clear from all of this is that we're adding value on top of, in addition to what the um, Linux distributors are doing. So, obviously, we only have a platform because of those uh, OS vendors and the work that they do in integrating security, testing, hardware enablement, all of those things. And then on top of that, we're adding another layer of value that reaches users and developers in a way that was not possible before. Um, and there are lots missing here, like SteamOS is one. This is just you know, the, um, the ones you need to worry about. SteamOS has Flathub built in. Um, the other thing that um, uh, you know, me and, and George are like, super proud about and really happy about is just the, the extent to which people are engaging within kind of Flathub as a community and seeing the value that it brings to them as app developers. So um, when I wrote a blog post last month, we were 1.5 thousand. So 1,500 has gone up by 100 in the past month. Um, and uh, I'll just hand over to George for a second. Yeah, so I actually showed this to a friend named Josh Stone, and he went digging into the Git history because I always thought, wow, 1600 sounds awfully round to me. Um, let's see if we can dig in more. And um, we have his methodology up on a GitHub repo because we, I think it's important that we start to like track this stuff. Um, but uh, using our methodology, which obviously needs some peer review here, he was. We found over 22,000 individuals have contributed to a repo uh, in the Flat Hub organization. And of those, 1,200 have at least five commits, so that's about 60% or whatever that turns out to be. And that's in the contributor ladder, you always have those like core people that are going to really drive stuff. And you're always going to have that long tail of people that like drop by, they might fix one or two things because they have a problem and then they move on. But this middle, this middle area here, this like kind of a middle ground for people that know enough to kind of get around what they need to do are the people that are training the next generation. And I'm really proud uh, of these numbers. And I'm going to try to find a way to like have these metrics. We should talk about this. And we should think about how we're doing this so we can you know, feel good about yourself so you have something positive that you can help when you're mentoring people to get them to onboard them. You know, unfortunately, um, there's no really reliable way to count non-code contributions in OSS like at all. And I just want to mention this. It's important because slide. we need you. Uh, you should know that we appreciate you. Um, by now, I think we know that building an ecosystem takes a village. So uh, if you're writing documentation, if you work on a website, it doesn't matter if you code, if you're helping people in chat, um, you're, you're the kind of people that helps build these communities. So I just wanted to 
insert that and then give it back to you, Rob. Cool. Um, the other thing that's uh, just landed um, over the past couple of months is a funky new rebrand. So um, nice new logos, new slide templates, and kind of applying a new theme on the website just to kind of freshen things up and sort of celebrate the, the new launch. Um, and speaking of new launch, actually meant to update these slides. Uh, we need to just strike through the uh, beta here because we've just put the new um, FlatHub website and web app is, is now online. So um, this brings out um, a whole bunch of changes and improvements kind of um, you know, behind the scenes. Uh, but the, the biggest user visible thing is just a, a much better website that gives um, way more details for um, each app page. So you can see things like uh, statistics, and so you can look at download counts, and you can, um, the user gets a lot more data about the application so they can see things like you know, uh, licenses and where to donate and all of these cool stuff. Um, the other thing that this puts live is our verification feature. Um, and way back at the start, I said that our goal was really to have this direct connection and this direct dialogue between developers and the users. Um, and so being able to know like, who's behind the FlatHub app is super important for everything that we're, we're building at the moment. Um, so this verification gives a way for the developer, um, the uploader to FlatHub, to, to, to validate that they are the person who's uploading to the, the application developer can show that they are the one that's uploading to FlatHub. So people have confidence that uh, the application they're downloading comes from that developer. Um, and even though we only came out of beta on Saturday, um, the, about a quarter of the apps, so you know, close to 500, have already been verified. So that's kind of really reassuring that FlatHub is, is performing our stated purpose, which is you know, not to make a, a sort of distro on distros. It's to put a venue for app developers to reach the users directly. Um, and when you do the verification, you show up in this cool verified app section. Um, and it just tells you what, what have we verified, the domain name, the GitHub account, or, or whatever. Um, we're hooked into KD and Gnome GitLab, so um, if you have an account there and you've used um, that to upload your app into FlatHub, then you get uh, verified through um, those systems. Um, goals for the coming year. So um, there's a bunch of legal work which is dreadfully exciting and it's going on behind the scenes. Um, the Gnome Foundation is in the process of setting up a nonprofit entity um, FlatHub LLC, working title, um, for a couple of reasons. And one is to kind of separate out the different activities, so the liability from shipping software, taking money from users, holding it and forwarding it on people's behalf. Um, it gives us an element of future proofing as well. Um, so if we need to change the legal structure, then things like our Stripe account and all of the contracts and things are in a legal entity that we could move. We can turn it into a corporation, we can sell it, you know, move it to the Linux Foundation or whatever we need to do. It gives us a vehicle to say, okay, FlatHub can, can travel separately to the Gnome Foundation. Um, also, super importantly, it gives us a different way to think about governance. It gives us a legal entity we can say, okay, the board for this entity works like this. So we want to make sure that, um, you know, I don't think a lot of complicated or exciting things will happen in the FlatHub LLC. It should just be there, like, you know, quietly going on. But we, we do want to make sure that we've got transparency in that decision making so that people kind of trust and they understand, like, who's there, what are they choosing uh, on behalf of, you know, app developers and the FlatHub users and things. Um, so some transparency there, like you know, board minutes or, or have some meetings um, that people can join in and, and take part. Um, and just keep a, a, a very simple structure. So um, you know, just some representatives from Gnome and KDE who are kind of working together to set up this new structure um, and some folks from the kind of FlatHub community. Um, that connection to the community, I mean, the, if we're not serving the developers and the users, there's no point doing this. Um, so, uh, you know, yesterday we had our kind of first FlatHub focus group, and that was a really great opportunity to speak to app developers who are using FlatHub. Um, and we'll be following that up with surveys and things and just keeping that communication open to understand, you know, what are people's needs, what are people's priorities, and, and how can we meet those in the FlatHub project. Um, over time, we're hoping to set up a sponsorship structure where, where potentially commercial stakeholders can join. We have an advisory board. They can advise. We can choose what to do. It's a separate thing. Um, but to bring in stakeholders then that represent different groups, so developers, um, OS vendors, and people who have an you know, interest in seeing kind of FlatHub evolve and succeed. Um, the other thing, which is um, we're, we're just sort of finishing off the technical bits and pieces, um, is the um, uh, ability for app developers to upload their apps directly. So basically managing your token through the developer corner in, in the FlatHub web app. Um, if you've verified that you are actually the developer, you can control that, that application, um, you know, domain name or, or GitHub project or whatever. Um, you can get the tokens and you can use your own build system to then build the application, make the flat pack, and then submit the binaries to um, FlatHub. Now, 
we kind of want to, this, this lets us move away from BuildBot, um, which is, we have a really weird pad to build bot and blah, and you know, we don't use that. We want either GitHub Actions or GitLab CI flows. Um, you know, Gnome and KDE both you know, building their own flat packs in their own GitLabs, and it makes perfect sense for the end of that to be about the flat hub. Um, so we can, we want to get there. We don't want to be sort of rebuilding stuff just for the sake of it. Um, and this also allows us to support different uh, language build systems. So you know, if, if people want to set up their own CI flow where their build can get to the internet, but they're happy with that because they've got their own container or their own VM or whatever it is, um, then we don't just have to use Flatback Builder as the, the kind of sandbox environment. People can build their Flatbacks however they want. Um, what we do want to do is make sure that we still have links back to the manifest, the source code, the build logs, so that we're not kind of trading sort of uh, transparency for convenience. We kind of want to keep both. Um, so we'll probably make some metadata changes so that you can always click a link and see, well, you know, let's to be this flat pack was built here on this CI system, and here's the, here's the logs, and you can see the source code that's gone into it, um, just so that we have a kind of chain back to, to what's being built and what's being published. We're not aiming for the, well, I built it on my laptop, and I'm going to upload it, and here's the binary, and yay. <laughs> um, Payments-wise, um, this kind of goes back to this removing economic barriers that I was talking about, that we want to, to make it possible for people to have kind of you know, good um, opportunity to, to earn and, and uh, participate um, you know, with sort of economic success in our ecosystem. Um, the, the code for accepting payments uh, is, is ready. It kind of gives us the, the basics for like a pay what you want thing, so you can do donations. Um, it lets developers make a split between um, how much goes to the application and how much goes to the platform. So if you want to support GNOME, KDE, Free Desktop, there's a slider, basically. Um, so FlatHub will collect those and, and send those on to, to the right organization. Um, there's some bits and pieces on the Stripe side that we need to kind of figure out. We're looking for some funding from NLNet to, to finish off the last bits. But the, the payment code works. Um, the blocker is mostly legal, so we need some developer agreements because we're going to take money for you and pass it on. We need some user agreements so you can ask for refunds or not, these kind of things. Um, so this bit of paperwork, basically, once we've got the LLC set up, we'll be able to, to kind of set up Stripe and integrate, you know, turn that code on, um, which is sort of there, but you know, feature flag in the, uh, the website we've just deployed. Um, last thing for me, um, sponsors. All of this um, takes time and money. Um, you know, we are increasing I guess the operational complexity of what we're doing to take in um, uh, you know, legal entity, different liability, potentially more work on reviewing applications and things. Um, so um, I kind of have a sketch of a budget of around $250,000 for you know, two full-time staff and the operating costs and legal and things. Um, we've raised 100K of that this year so far um, from Endless, um, looking for another 50 from NLNet, so we still have a gap, 100K. Um, we might be able to kind of you know, limp on without the second person, but I think Bart could really use a hand. Um, so if anyone has any ideas, basically potentially grants or, or commercial entities that we should approach and talk about sponsorship, they might have an interest in, in kind of using cloud technologies as a, a way to sort of contain apps on the desktop, build tools that, that bring um, the desktop and uh, sort of cloud workflows together. Um, any ideas, greatly appreciated. Um, last thought for me, um, thanks to all of these organizations for their time, effort, support, resources. Um, all of our downloads go through Fastly. Most of our build bots are from uh, Equinix. Um, uh, Endless has been uh, sponsoring you know, time and development that's gone into this. Um, Mythic Beasts runs a lot of our core servers in Cambridge. So thanks to all of our sponsors. Uh, and now over to George. Hello. All right. Looks like I have 15 minutes. So I'll just say like next slide and stuff, Rob. Try to make it easy. Um, I wanted to tell a specific story because this is the second year we're doing this and we're showing graphs and numbers and all that stuff. But um, I, I've also been digging and experiencing some things and I kind of wanted to like relate the story in human terms. Um, in case you don't know me, I'm the guy who believes that cloud and gaming will save the Linux desktop and I'm happy to be here for it. Next slide, please. Um, specifically, I like to talk about the improvements in gaming uh, in, my, in my life here. Um, I have a Linux desktop and the freedesktop.org Mesa stack for my hardware has seen um, massive improvements in the last year. And I would like to talk about that just from my experience and hopefully whatever cool app or thing that you're into that's in Flathub, you can kind of uh, think about the journey that you've taken with a thing that you're passionate about. So uh, these things are what's necessary to make the gaming experience 
uh, on Flathub be really great, and I use them a lot. Uh, next slide. So I've been playing through a lot of triple A games, and uh, one day I just decided to go for it, and I bought a really nice GPU and a really big, wide, ultra-wide ultra monitor, and I started playing triple A games, and I'm having the time of my life, and, um, you know, as far as gaming goes, and having been through this journey, like, this used to be really, really hard, right? And while you still can buy a device that kind of gets you there, uh, getting it there on the desktop continues to be a challenge for people. And um, these days, I'm just kind of running it, and those numbers in the top and the right, those version numbers and stuff, like, I really have to pay attention to those or my games wouldn't work. And lately, I've noticed I don't have to pay attention as much. Um, and that's a good thing. And I want to talk about that a little bit and what, what processes that exercises. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm working on a thing, and I, I, I said, hey, my, my favorite thing features a flat hub gaming experience. And, and a cynical person on the Internet responded, that's not even a feature, man. Like, you can get that on any distro. And I like to thank that person for dunking on me because that is the best flat hub slogan that, like, I, like I could possibly come up with a better flat hub slogan. Like, yes, that's the entire point is to make your stuff work. Like, literally, that's our only job. Next slide, please. And this experience is important to you even if you don't game because it exercises a lot of the things in Linux that we need uh, to help fix stuff that might be important to you. So getting draft graphics drivers out to people faster, right? Getting that tight feedback loop of the developer directly to the user so we can rev faster and figuring out ways that we can make that more efficient uh, because people are really, really starting to like that development flow and that speed of development that they get. Next slide, please. I talked about this uh, a lot last year, how we're all kind of pipe, pipe builders now, right? Our job is to deliver stuff and get it to the end user. Um, and I think if you've seen the numbers, like, this is working, right? The pipeline gives us that velocity, this decoupling, um, and, and keeping the distro and those apps nice and separate and separate layers, right? It just leads to greater reliability and while, while we're mitigating that risk. Next. But we do have some challenges, right? Like, I, I've been playing through just all the AAA games, but I was also still smart enough because I'd been around the block to know when to buy that GPU, right? Like I literally had on my phone a reminder so that when in Git someone tagged that version of Mesa that I needed for my 7900 XTX, like I bought the card that day. Uh, but you have to know that. But gone through a few generations now, that time it takes for me to get the thing, um, and by the time I'm able to actually use it on my Linux computer, is shortening, um, and that's that's what I want to share with you today because I think we should start figuring that out a little bit. And um, so those hardware support expectations are, are, are difficult, right? Like I don't understand why I can buy a $1,500 GPU and it's still a, a pain for me to get it to work in Linux, right? It's We know this is a challenge for Linux. Um, and of course, hey, I'd love to tell you last year I was very bullish about uh, Microsoft Edge maybe coming and helping us out and taking over the flat pack, and that didn't happen, you know? Um, but we're gonna keep trying. That's that's just literally our job, and you know, it's to engage with as many of these people as can to get their applications to work. Um, and as always, we can all be a little bit nicer when we're engaging with those Linux-averse companies. Next slide. Um, and I'd also like to work this year, I'm pitching that value to the quote-unquote old distros, the LTSs, the enterprise Linuxes, something like the flat hat flat hub stack on top of like a more um, traditional, slower paced enterprise ready. You know, the, a lot of people use those. It's literally paying for everything right now. So um, I've been experimenting a lot with like kind of bringing this fresh new stuff uh, to more people who might be a little bit more um, risk averse as far as running their machines. But they still want to get a little bit of that bling, which is nice. Um, please ask your distros to commit to enablement. In order for all of this to work, like flat pack has to not only be in your distro, but it needs to be up to date. Um, and, and if your distro isn't doing that, find a way uh, to, to volunteer or reach out to us if, if, if somebody needs help. Uh, but the distro has to want to participate. And sometimes that doesn't happen, and that sucks. Um, I think of it this way. I looked at the Mesa contributors in the FDO uh, area, and there was like 100 of you like who have worked on this that made that video game run really awesome on my GPU, right? 
if I was making a distro, I would consider that an economic advantage to take advantage of your work because that is amazing to me. So thank you to those of you who've been doing that. Next slide, please. And of course, we still have dreaded paper cuts. This, this dialogue is the bane of my existence. Sometimes I try to save a file and then like tries to put it here. Um, but I'm still gonna celebrate because as a GNOME user, I have a working file picker now. So anything is possible, uh, but there's still challenges and, and bugs that need to be fixed. So hang in there uh, with us. We're making a lot of progress. Next slide. Hang on time, looks like I'm okay. Um, and this leads to increased velocity, right? You know, software and KDE Discover, like with the flat pack stuff, like that was a rough year, man. Like, you know, it, it, was, it was a little rough. If you worked on this, thank you very much. And it's like actually really good now and performant. And I know there's a lot of work, a lot of people are doing work in that area and, and that's actually starting to get good. The website looks great. We've got distros that are, are getting more committed now. They're more proud to ship this stuff. That's really great. And then uh, we have open stats for the community to see. Don't, you know, don't forget that, that walled garden model. Like, I don't wanna see that. I wanna go and see all the apps the cool kids are using. I wanna see the numbers, like a proper open source project. So that's cool and we should, we should maintain that. Uh, next slide. So uh, this is called Guess the App. I showed you, we've shown you a lot of graphs that are going up and to the right with growth. There's one app that's just flat. And I was totally surprised when I was found out what the app this is. Um, we're running out of time, but if you can guess what this app is, I will tell you next slide in four, five, four, three, two, one. Next slide. It's Flat Seal. Flat Seal is that app that everyone tells you that you have to have in order to make flat packs useful. Now, if all the downloads and everything are going up and to the right in like this amazing looking curve, but flat seals remaining flat, I'm, I'm going to start. I'm going to start a hypothesis that says maybe stuff is getting better, right? And maybe maybe we should start paying attention to that and start to look at, you know, the the the, the problems that people are having and and kind of showing to see where we are as far as as filing those edges down so people enjoy using stuff. So. To me, this says that the apps are evolving, right? Users are starting to understand the toolkits are better now, right? Investing in these portals is a good idea. It's the desktop API we needed, and that's what we talked about last year. And that feedback loop between developers and users is getting tighter, and you can feel it when you're using this stack every day and consuming it, especially in something complicated, like playing AAA video games written for an entirely different operating system. Pretty cool, huh? Um, next slide, please. But I do want to remember that not all bugs are created equal. I know some of you out there have doubts about whether switching to Flatpak is a good idea. And, I'm, you know, bugs happen. I'm sorry about Flatpak overrides. Let me just make it clear. Our priority will be to always make the application work first. Sometimes you're going to have an extra runtime in there that shouldn't be there. Sorry. The application has to work first. We know that that's what people hate about Linux. And I know it sucks. But we got to make the apps work first. So I know. I know sometimes, sometimes I miss that disk space too, but there's a lot of cool trickery going on to make that, that could be way more expensive than it is. So I think it's worth it. And I think if you look at the download numbers, users are starting to agree with us. So it's time to, let's kill that myth forever, huh? Uh, next slide. Um, and I just wanted to say this again, but I know I'm running out of time. Next slide. And I had a long monologue here uh, about how, like, how Destiny users and Linux users are very similar uh, communities where they have a thing they're very passionate about, but they also have this, like, sometimes it feels you have this love-hate relationship with a thing. Uh, but we're going to save that one for another day. Uh, next slide. This year, I want you to all concentrate to tell a story, and this is, like, the last thing I'm going to talk about. Next slide. This is a Dynakyrus. We found the bones of this thing and everyone thought it was gonna be some like bloodthirsty predator thing. It ends up being it's this like platypus duck derpy looking dinosaur thing. Um, and, and it totally changed the idea of what we thought this creature is, right? In a lot of ways, like the preconceived notions of what we thought this creature was just like went out the windows. Like no one would have, like look at this thing. This is just odd or whatever, right? Um, and I'd like to bring some of that kind of more science-based approach back to the Linux desktop when we're talking about improving these things like that, where it's like, you know what, maybe it might look a little bit different than you would expect. And, you know, next slide, um, 
Yeah. yeah, read between the lines, right? Extinction is a thing, right? And certain things have to change. This is called the Harpy Eagle. This thing is brutal, right? And it's the evolution of the thing that came before it, right? And sometimes when we're talking about these systems, we're talking about evolving the Linux desktop to that zero trust model. I swear, if I have to say the cloud native desktop again, you're all gonna like really get sick of me saying that. But it, it really is about, we're starting to see with the reliability, things are much better. The tools are better. Y'all are working smarter than ever before. The tools are here and I'm really excited. And I want you to tell that story and I want you to start working with our content creators. Next slide. Um, tell the story, like we need to document this. Like you're watching a nature documentary and sometimes it feels when you start to read about the development of this stuff that you're watching a reality show, right? And I don't wanna watch a reality show. I wanna watch about that cool dinosaur you know, and how, how, how it came to be. I want to know, like, the thought process that developers go through, you know, to, to figure out a thing. But in order to do that, we have to up that discourse that we're having between our communities. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Did I go over? Rob, did I get too preachy again? <laughs> Thanks, everyone. You're all great. We, we got all that. I would have said sooner if it didn't. <laughs> cool. Um, we have like time for one question or maybe two, I don't know. So, so when the payments are coming to FlatHub, I see it really cool. Um, will it get integrated into KDE Discover and GNOME software? So the, the way it will work, unless we do it better, <laughs> is it will, um, Flatpak will know that it needs a token, and so it will basically ask this authenticator thing that will probably open a web view or a web browser. Um, so that's where we can start from. But the API for the back end is available to do some better integration. Um, the nature of credit cards on Stripe is that ultimately you have to put your credit card number into a web view because you might get bounced through some other junk to authenticate the payment. So the actual paying bit or even adding it to your wallet has to be done in the web view. Once you've done that, and um, the authenticator has your credentials, it's possible to integrate more of the, the you know, buy an app that can go into a native UI, um, as long as the payment setup can give you a web view at least once. Um, so we'll, we'll start with just popping up a web view and then we'll iterate from there because the API will be available if you have the token. Um, actually, one unsolved question is like, how should we have users log into FlatHub? Do we owe off through something else? And we have like web junk, we have our own account thing, then we have password recovery. So I don't actually know. So that's a question we need to answer. Like at the moment, we log developers in through, you know, GitLab or GitHub, right? But that's not what we want everyone to do. So uh, ideas on a postcard. <laughs> that's great. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks so much. Have a good day. Cool. Yo. <laughs> bye bye.